Okay, so good evening, everybody. We're really excited to have you join us. If you all wouldn't mind just going on mute while we're um, in session, that'd be great. Um, perfect, thank you. So we have Food Business Basics. This is our fourth session and it's all about agriculture and farming. And we're really excited to have both White Rabbit Gardens and Organic Redneck Farms. And I'll introduce both of them a little bit later. I'm partnering with Micah Elkonen this evening from Eugene's Table, and he'll get a chance as well to share more about what he does. But Micah, I just have to say, it's been a joy to work with you. I'm super excited about this partnership. And Micah is also getting married this weekend. I gotta say it on the air. So lots of, lots of uh, good vibes to you, Micah. So that's exciting. Um, I'm Ariel Rubin, the Lane County Venture Catalyst with Oregon Rain. I also have my own marketing firm, and I like to say I'm the innovation strategist for my family's business, Hummingbird Wholesale, which basically means I'm next generation, always trying to push buttons and move my parents forward. That's just how it is. That's our job as kids. So yeah, <laughs> Micah, if you wanna introduce yourself, that would be awesome. Great, yeah. Hi, I'm Micah. Uh, I'm the president of Season to Taste. Uh, I do consulting with uh, emerging food businesses and uh, food systems organizations. Uh, one of the main projects we're working on or that we've been working on for the past few years is called Eugene's Table, which is a partnership of Eugene area food and beverage manufacturing companies. Um, and in a previous life, uh, about oh, 15 years ago, I, I was a private chef uh, down in Southern California and had a did uh, meal deliveries for uh, folks down there. It was called the Educated Vegetable. That's me. Awesome, thanks, Micah. Sweet, so just quick, <laughs> we love it. So quick agenda. Um, this is just a short welcome and introduction, and then we'll dive into the panel discussion. And you're welcome to ask questions throughout or put them in the chat, and then we'll close around 6.30. And quick virtual etiquette, if you wouldn't mind, remain, sorry, if you wouldn't mind remaining muted throughout the session, that'd be awesome just to avoid background noise. And like I mentioned, you can put questions in the chat or you can even use the raise hand feature. And this is of course a place of learning. So just remember to be supportive and polite in conversation. And this is being recorded and we'll make sure to put that on YouTube after the fact. So you're welcome to share with anyone and um, review yourself. Just quickly, a little bit about Oregon Rain. So we partner with rural communities across Oregon to catalyze entrepreneurial ecosystems, connect entrepreneurs to resources, including overlooked entrepreneurs, and contribute to the creation of prosperous economies. And we do that, we like to say we're building infrastructure for startups. So essentially making sure that all these pieces are activated in the small community, that there's mentors and networking opportunities and workshops and you know physical assets like incubator kitchens and co-working spaces and capital and local government support and workforce, news and media, all those different elements. And we can't do this alone. So we love catalyzing community. So all are welcome. Please join in. We'd love to hear your ideas of how we can improve and bring more people together and support small businesses. And a huge thank you as always to our partners, mentors, entrepreneurs, and funders. We love creating thriving entrepreneurial ecosystems with all of you. This is our team. We're scattered across Oregon. So always reach out. There's probably someone near you who can support in what you're doing. And I'm going to hand it over to Micah to talk a little bit about Eugene's Table. Great. Yeah. So as I mentioned, uh, Eugene's Table is a, a partnership, food and beverage uh, manufacturing companies in the greater Eugene area or Lane County. Uh, we primarily do three main uh, things for the industry here. We help strengthen connections amongst uh, businesses and professionals within the industry. Uh, we help to amplify marketing and PR, both for member companies and the region as a whole. And we act as sort of chief instigator or catalyst for bringing more resources into the region uh, to help strengthen uh, the food and beverage uh, economy here in Lane County. Uh, yeah, and if you have questions about it, you can feel free to reach out to me. Ariel's got my email address uh, in the slide there. Sweet, awesome. Thanks so much, Micah. 
Okay, so what's next is our model, is our motto at RAIN. We always love talking about what's next. So there's always free resources available. You can email me anytime, always happy to help. And then of course, weekly mentorship. Um, if you have questions or thoughts on literally any business topic, if I don't have the answer, I'll help you get the answer through our extensive network. So please reach out. Um, this is a five-part series we're super excited about. And it's uh, the last one is actually next Thursday. And um, it's beer, wine, and spirits. So if you're interested in, in those three topics, please join in. And we'll have Homegrown Brewery, Hayworth Winery, and Coburg Distilling represented next week. Tonight, like I mentioned, we have agriculture and farming with White Rabbit Gardens and Organic Redneck. And I'm super excited to introduce Alice Morrison, the owner of White Rabbit Gardens and program manager with Friends of Family Farmers and Jack Richardson, the owner of Organic Redneck Farm. And with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and actually have them introduce themselves a little bit deeper and get into their stories. And Micah will be our moderator. So, awesome. here we go. <laughs> yeah, so um, before, what, the way I'll, I'll run this is I've got a few uh, specific questions that I'll be asking Alice and Jack. And then we'll leave some time at the end for everybody else to ask any questions that come up. But before I get into that, uh, I'd love for Alice and Jack to just give us a quick rundown of uh, what they do in the community and, and maybe a little bit of their background about how they, they got into that uh, position of work. Um, so uh, Alice, let's start with you and then we'll finish up with Jack. Okay, great. Um, thank you all for having me tonight. My name is Alice Morrison. I am one of the two co-owners of White Rabbit Gardens, and I'm also the or, uh, Oregon Pasture Network Program Manager for Friends of Family Farmers, which is a statewide nonprofit that um, helps farmers in terms of um, advocacy, technical assistance, and community support. So here, I'm going to drop in my chat, the chat, this is my farm website, and this is the organization that is my off-farm job. Um, so I guess that's something that I'll talk about later is that um, my, I am, I would say that I'm at the, the end of the beginning of my farm journey. I have um, only been farming actively for five years. I uh, did not grow up in an agricultural family and I came to Oregon in 2014 to become a community organizer on food system issues. I worked on several uh, legislative and ballot measure campaigns um, with a nonprofit based out of Portland and it was always about food. And then I uh, kind of had a quarter life crisis and realized I wanted to be the people that I served instead of the organizer serving them. So I, uh, my partner and I put all our stuff in storage and we went on a 90 day long bike trip with our dog in a trailer to try to find out what we wanted to do with our lives. And then uh, when we stopped doing that, um, like 3,500 miles later, we decided to move to Eugene and forcibly inserted ourselves into the farming community of Western Lane County. We just uh, showed up until people hired us and we did some work for free. And then we um, did two full seasons working on other people's farms. Um, and that was, I, th I think we were really, really lucky to, um, we both started out working on a small farm in Veneta called Ambrosia Farm, um, which actually no longer exists, but we worked, we were hit the only crew. It was just me and my partner working for um, Farmer Brandon. And then the next season I went to a different small farm in that area. I worked for La Trois Farm in No Tie. And they're another great um, family operation. At the time, I was also their only employee, which I guess I specialize in. Um, and um, my partner actually did a season at Wintergreen Farm, which is a much larger operation. So we kind of got those two different perspectives of like the really small family homestead type deal and a larger, um, more production focused operation that had been around for a really uh, much longer period of time. And then we, lucked into um, the land that we're living on now. We moved to Cedar Flat, which is technically unincorporated Lane County, um, outside kind of between Springfield and Walterville. Um, we moved here in 2018, no, oh, maybe maybe earlier, I'll check. But um, we are now entering our third season 
farming on the place that we're at. We started our business. Um, we started really small because we thought it would be better to fail small, but we have maintained um, a and grown a little bit. We're taking incremental change. Um, and yeah, we're entering our third season with White Rabbit Gardens. And uh, I will get more into our other stuff later. Oh, I also, um, I took kind of like an ecosystems approach to getting into the farming and agriculture world. And um, so while I was working for those other farms, I also started running the Vanita Farmer's Market, which is a small rural farmer's market. And I did that for three seasons. Um, and then last year was the first year I didn't do that because I was focusing on the farm. And um, I also sit on the board of the Oregon Farmers Market Association. So I am helping to uh, provide resources for other uh, farmers markets across the state. And like, I'm really focused on trying to help uh, build sustainability for small and rural farmers markets um, because I think those are so vital to our community vibrance in this state in particular. I hadn't lived somewhere where there were so many tiny little farmers markets that just feed the immediate community and I thought it was really cool. Um, I started working for Friends of Family Farmers as an off-farm job to supplement our farm income um, in January of 2020 and yeah I think that's the whole ecosystem of me. So Jack, take it away. Cool. <laughs> you have a lot, a lot you're involved in. I feel um, yeah. like I don't have that much going on now, which is a nice adjustment. Um, which is not true, Jack. You have a lot going on. <laughs> um, yeah, I, uh, I was gonna try to screen share here, just so that there's a few pictures of the farm while I talk and um, see how this works. And they're sort of unprepared photos, but it would just be um, a little bit of a, a little bit more um, interesting to look at. There, there we go. Um, so yeah, um, I'm Jack Richardson and I have been um, farming for quite a few years. I had the, um, the privilege and opportunity to farm land um, that my family had purchased and farmed before me. Um, the farm that my parents ran was a bit more of a farmstead and we did things like milk cows by hand. Um, we grew a big garden, sold some blueberries and a few other crops. Um, it was a great childhood growing up around that. My brother and I took more ownership of, um, around the farm about 10 years ago. And um, yeah, um, he backed out after a few years um, and went on to do other great things. Um, and I continued on farming. And um, it's, you know, it's been a journey. It's grown a lot over the years. Like I say, it came from pretty um, humble beginnings and we've always grown blueberries at a production scale, but many of the uh, other crops that we're growing today are, um, I'm gonna pause this slideshow here because it's distracting me, um, but that's a pretty shot. Um, yeah, so, um, We've had to build a lot of infrastructure up to transition from that sort of farmstead to more of a production farm that um, can, you know, pay a bit of a wage to not only um, the, the owners, but also the people who work there. And that is still a um, ongoing evolution. But um, one thing that remains is the wide breadth of crops we grow um, and the unique layout on the farm. Uh, there are a lot of fruit trees and other perennials scattered around the farm, uh, many of which I planted um, as a kid or, or since then. Um, we're still very unique um, in, the, in the sense that we dabble in a lot of different crops and marketing channels. Um, I still love growing food and the growing journey the plants take me on uh, every year and it's challenging but rewarding. Um, 
to add to all the things that interest me in farming, um, I've also been getting involved with seed growing more and uh, seed uh, selection, breeding, um, and growing garden starts as well. Um, yeah, that kind of sums it up. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Uh, so, yeah, let me ask a few questions of you both. Um, oh, yeah, Jack, do you want to stop sharing your screen so that we can see everybody? Even yeah, though that's obnoxious of me. I'm sorry. That's a very good got to remember that. Yeah. <laughs> um screen share off yeah there's a zoom control that sometimes hides uh-huh okay let's see stop that's sharing. okay thank you yay for, yeah. uh, no worries <laughs> so yeah uh what i was curious about is uh i find that it, you know i've seen in my interactions with young farmers and small farms sometimes uh there is, uh, with enthusiasm for growing food, there is sometimes uh, uh, not as much thought put into the final destination for that food or, or where the, the money's gonna come in the door. Uh, so I'm curious uh, where you guys sell your products and, and, and what you do to reach new customers. Um, do you find that there are certain benefits and or certain challenges with specific channels uh, or customers that you've chosen to focus on? Uh, yeah, wrap on that for me a little bit. Uh, we'll just stick with the same order. Alice, you can start. Sure. Um, so I do exclusively direct to consumer sales uh, because I'm at a scale where I need that premium price. I, I can't afford um, to go a wholesale route for all of my stuff because we are at a scale where it just doesn't pencil out. So I do um, direct to consumer sales at farmers markets. We sell through our website and um, we also do like some, um, well, we're looking to do more of this, but like we've done it like here and there, just partnering with local businesses. Like there's, there's a gas station at the bottom of the hill that is pretty much the only business in Cedar Flat. And um, I am working up a proposal to approach them to have a farm stand there. Um, because we're not really, um, we're not easy to find and we kind of like that and we don't have insurance to have people out on the farm. We don't have an on-farm farm stand as of right now. Uh, we're currently leasing land and so when we make our like final land purchase, um, it might be this property, it might not be this property, who knows, the future is, is vast. Um, and so we would like to have an on-farm farm stand at some point, but we want to maintain for right now our privacy and um, reduce liability by not having folks at the farm because we're not the scale where we can, can handle it right now. So um, farmers markets, I choose to only sell at small and rural markets because um, we're a new farm. We don't have um, a ton of volume to do like a huge market. We have a lot, we have a vast variety, but we don't have like an overwhelming volume of any given crop. And so when you're in that position, it can sometimes be helpful to go to the smaller markets where you um, can like, have more time to get to know your customers or what they're into and um, introduce them to new things. And uh, so I, we do the Whitaker community market and we did sell at Vanita up until last year, but now that we live in Cedar Flat, when we lived in Vanita, it made a lot more sense. But now that we live in Cedar Flat, that's a little too far for us. So we decided to pare that back and only do one market and focus on our um, website sales and, um, partnering with local businesses to do pop-ups and things like that. I think the benefits of it, obviously doing direct to consumer only is like, I get the highest price possible for my crops because I'm not paying anybody in between to do any finagling. Um, but the drawback is that you spend a ton of time at market. Like, oh my gosh, markets take so much time and there is specialized skill. Um, and you have certain equipment that goes along with that. You have to have displays and your pop-up and have everything worked out. Um, and um, sometimes, well, my partner and I, we uh, were, our farm is just the two of us. We don't have regular employees that do field work for us, but we do have um, 
folks who do markets for us when we can't uh, be away from the farm to do it. So uh, when you have to factor in that cost and paying people to do markets for you when you can't get there, um, it's just all a, a balancing game. Um, but yeah, those are my sales outlets. Great, thanks. Yeah, that's great, Alice. Um, that sounds sounds like we do some similar things for similar reasons, actually, um, even though we're at a little different scale. Um, yeah, so we prefer to sell direct to customers uh, or as close to it as we can get similarly for um, for that that price difference. And, you know, there's other benefits in there. I mean, building um, building a farm uh, name and and people who are you know real um, supporters and, and fans of yours? I think is much easier at a farmers market, and you get to you know sort of be out there and, and talk to people and, and build those relationships. So there's a lot of benefit to that. Um, when we used to do farmers markets, when I first ventured to do that, um, we made very little money at the markets, and it was a long drive and. Um, booth fees seem like a lot. And so I just called it uh, networking or, or, you know, marketing, but, but not so much that selling the produce was really paying our way. It certainly wasn't paying my time. Um, but uh, anyway, so yeah, when I say as close to direct sales as possible, we do sell at farmer's markets, but we also sell to stores and a few restaurants. Um, but, you know, directly to stores, there's no... Um, you might call that wholesale, but we generally call it direct to store. Uh, it's it's a it's a form of wholesale, but there's not a wholesaler um, that kind of stands between us and the retailer. So, um, and then yeah, we work with um, a few groups too that are um, pretty neat. I just wanted to mention like Lane County Bounty, which is relatively new, but they're just doing a, a online um, ordering platform where you can order produce. Um, weekly and, and they uh, deliver it around town. And um, there's a similar version of that agricultural connections um, in Bend that we've worked with over the years as well, that does pretty good work. Um, and, and it gets our produce over that way. And, and they pick it up from us at the farm because um, they're heading over that way by our farm, which works out because we would never um, be able to get a truck over to Bend. So yeah, time is obviously uh, a finite resource. And so when we think about marketing, um, it certainly would save us time to do more direct sales to stores or, or true wholesale. Um, and once we start paying more people to do that, I think that might make a little bit more sense. And I think a little bit more wholesale um, every time we crunch those numbers and we, we look at how much time we spend and money we spend on um, staffing a farmer's market and whatnot. Uh, but anyway, a couple other places we sell, um, we do a weekly uh, CSA share uh, box of produce that people get. Um, we deliver it uh, all the way up to McKenzie, Bri uh, McKenzie Bridge and people pick up at the farm and then several locations around Eugene Springfield. And we also uh, have a farm stand uh, in Lieberg. Um, and that's been there since long before I was alive. It, it just kind of came with the farm. There's always been some blueberries there. So uh, it, was, it wasn't something that we had to build as much. Um, so that was just sort of a, um, a benefit. And we've certainly grown um, the diversity of stuff we offer. And we've changed that a bit over the years. But yeah. I think that's about it for our marketing venues. Awesome. Thanks, guys. That's helpful. Um, <coughs> switching gears a little bit. What tools or tactics, <coughs> excuse me, what tools or tactics do you guys use to help uh, calculate or understand the, the profitability of different uh, products that you produce? Uh, and how do you continue to ensure or I, or I should say more simply, how do you continue to ensure that the farm is making money? Uh, Alice, you can go ahead again. Sure. Um, 
So I do need to be upfront with you. We're in our third year of production. We are not yet in the black. And uh, that is something that is a reality of starting a farm from scratch is that, and I mean, any small business, like you can look up the stats on that. Folks are often not profitable in their first three to five years, especially in agriculture because of the infrastructure costs. Um, if you're not like buying a turnkey operation, there's a lot you need to build. Um, and so things that we do to ensure profitability are like, <laughs> Uh, well, also it's part of our ethos is to reduce waste. And I say like, we sell everything that we grow three ways. Uh, we sell plant starts um, in the spring. We have a nursery license with ODA and we sell plant starts direct to consumer um, that are the excess from what we need um, in the field. And then we sell fresh produce, obviously. And then we also sell a good amount of um, value added products to, so that there's no like when we when we bring stuff home from market, um, one of my my chief positions at the farm is um, I am I guess it would be CCO chief canning officer. Yeah, so uh, we do a lot of um, because of the wonderful um, farm direct producer process exemption that exists here in Oregon. If you grow all the produce on site, you can do a certain amount of uh, up to $20,000 of um, value added products, like the ones that are considered low risk by the food safety folks. Um, actually, Friends of Family Farmers, the organization I work for, helped to pass that law in 2012. So full circle. And um, so we sell jams and pickles and sauces to make sure that everything that we grow um, to reduce as much waste in the system and to make sure that we are um, getting the most out of everything that we grow. Um, I think that we have made, it's also, it can be hard for a small, small farm to make these assessments like in your first year, like you can do a lot of market research. Like if you go to farmer's markets and talk to people, obviously like wait till the rush has passed and don't talk to people when they have a line. But um, if you go and talk to folks about like, what their like what is the thing that moves the fastest or uh what they grow every year or something like that like the staples um for us that turns into um like we have to have salad mix we have to have broccoli we have like broccoli sells like hotcakes for us i don't know if that's a universal but um I think that like winnowing down, we started with a ton of variety, like way too much variety, honestly. And we have um, over the last three years, winnowed down to crops that like A, grow really well where we're at because we're on some pretty untraditional farmland and uh, non-traditional, I guess untraditional is not a word, but non-traditional farmland um, in a, in a, that had never been farmed before. And so we have to be careful with what we lean into because if we put a lot of money into um, seed that we think is going to be great or stars, but then they just don't do well with our soil chemistry. Um, and then we've, then we've wasted, we have a total crop failure and that can be a huge bummer for both your like personal morale and your bottom line. Um, so we have done a lot of trial and error in what works for our soil and um, keeping pretty detailed records about how much we're moving at markets um, of certain things. So we know like what our customer base is really excited about. Um, because when, like Jack was saying, the direct to consumer model is all about those relationships and getting those regulars to um, really look for you at the market. And so if you know what those folks are interested in, um, and what they are buying every week that can really add up to um, a solid crop plan, hopefully. Um, so yeah, I guess in terms of profitability, keeping really detailed sales records so I know what to plant next year and um, selling everything three times if I can. <laughs> three different ways, not three times. <laughs> cool. Um... I'm just gonna look at my notes here real quick. I, I took a few notes on um, what I was going to say here. Um, and yeah, I think um, I think I always regret our main metric for success is our profit and loss statement or balance sheet. But 
um, ultimately uh, profitability determines if you get to come back and do it again next season. So uh, it's, it's, it's important for sure. Um, one of the ways we've taken the farm from a, a large food garden um, that had a kind of permaculture feel to it um, to, uh, to what it is now is the use of tractors and greenhouses and, and developing systems around all the things we do. Um, we're continually trying to narrow down our cost of production for each crop. Um, but similarly, we have a lot of crops and this is kind of a perennial or um, I think common problem that a lot of small vegetable farms have is, is not great numbers for their cost of production. So we're getting better at it, um, but still not, um, it's not clear that we have a good number for every crop and what it costs to grow. Um, but I wanted to mention that I've been working a little bit with um, uh, a woman at Oregon Tilth um, and there's sort of a shared uh, project with Oregon Tilth and I think there's funding from OSU as well. Um, for uh, determining the cost of production in various enterprises on a small vegetable farm. And Tanya Murray is the one who's making that happen. And she's someone who's worked on small organic farms, so has seen the problem uh, firsthand. And so um, has, has taken on this pretty big challenge and it's pretty complicated. And um, it's why I don't have, I, I've been working a little bit with her for maybe three or four years now and and we're still not to the place where uh, I can tell you what that bunch of parsley cost um, to grow. Um, I might be able to tell you what the what the bunch of basil costs, but that's only one out of the 40 or 100 different things that come off the farm. So <laughs> um, yeah, uh, let's see. Yeah, I think I think that's about all I wanted to say on that. Can I ask a related question, interrupting here? So I know that a lot of big agriculture is subsidized. And I was reading a statistic that like corn and soy, which are the most productive crop, are literally making like negative 75%. So they're basically only surviving because of government subsidies. So I just want to know like, and they always say like, oh, small scale agriculture isn't economical or something so you have to go big or go home but then I'm like seeing those numbers and being like they're not profitable they're losing 75 cents to every dollar and they're just getting by with government subsidies so like what is the tipping point that this might be a hard question but like is yeah like when does it go from being not productive to productive to then not productive again uh I could Try to start. Do you have anything you want to add on that, Alice? <laughs> Man, I wish I knew. I feel like if we knew, we would all be millionaires rolling in food, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I so I have thoughts on that. You know, they're not um, they're not all backed up um, by by knowledge of what actually happens in the large scale vegetable world. Um, but a couple of things I think are interesting about corn and soy is those subsidies. And, and I think that's one of the reasons that there's a lot of investment in farm ground right now is because those, those subsidies are kind of guaranteed funding that um, is, is pretty predictable. And so uh, turns out that farm ground can produce profit. It's just that the crop's not actually the one producing the profit. Um, for vegetables, uh, I don't know how many subsidies there are, but there was a big subsidy in 2020 um, the coronavirus food assistance program through the USDA. And a lot of local farms, uh, I think, applied for that and, and some got it and, and big farms got it too, but there was just a decent amount of money that was put out there to assist farms that were not set up to you know, be nimble with the changing you know, food consumption um, that happened really quickly last year. And it was pretty widely available to to any farm that grew a pretty wide number of crops, but you did, you know, you had to have a certain amount of, um, you know, history of growing those crops. So, you know, if you don't have good data or haven't been doing it um, at least a year or two, it might be harder to get that money. But um, yeah, so I would just to say we did actually get a subsidy in 2020, which is the first, you know, true crop subsidy that I think has ever been available or that we've ever gotten. 
Um, and there's a few other subsidies too that happen like the equip grants for greenhouses um, and a lot of small farms have taken advantage of those and they you know offset the cost of building a greenhouse um, to the tone of maybe like six or seven thousand um, dollars and there's some irrigation grants as well for uh, through through the uh, USDA equip program as well, cover crop grants maybe too. So there's, there's some things out there for other types of agriculture, but they're they're in their infancy compared to some of the larger subsidies, I think, so, yeah. Yeah, to add to what Jack just said, there definitely are programs um, available through USDA to help um, more diversified or smaller farms, especially like, um, from NRCS, there's like a lot of conservation grants as available as well. Like if part of your farm system is trying to protect your riparian buffer zones, or like you want to um, control runoff from your like sacrifice ground for your cattle or whatever. Um, and like those types of big like infrastructure projects, there is definitely money um, available for those. Um, I would, I think that it's interesting that the corn and soy subsidies, I feel like there's like a little bit of a difference there because they're kind of guaranteed. And then these other programs are like, you have to apply and people apply year after year after year and don't get them. Like I know some folks who it took like six rounds of applying to get an equip grant for a greenhouse, but maybe they were just like not savvy in the grant process also. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I think that there's there is funding out there if you know how to get it, and um, I think that they're they're making some positive changes for sure. Um, but a lot of it still depends on your relationship with the the local FSA office, and if you have a good relationship with them, they'll tell you about stuff when it comes up that applies to you. Um, and if you don't have a good relationship with them, then like for example, the the CFAP program um the first round of it you had to go through an fsa office to do it the second round you could do on your own which was great um and so like those kinds of things are a little bit harder for smaller farms to access because there's still some pretty outdated um opinions about what a farm really is at fsa and by their own admission like if I went into an FSA office, I think they would say, that sounds like a hobby, go have fun in your garden. <laughs> but um, because I don't have um, that many acres in production and I don't have the profitability that they're looking to see, they're more used to dealing with folks who are more conventional. Um, so yeah, there's definitely money out there. Uh, and sometimes you need a little help finding it or finding how to access it. I was just going to mention one resource that I've seen. I don't know too much about the how good it is, but it's called FarmRaise, and it's farmraise.com, R-A-I-S-E, and they essentially find government money or grants available out there. Um, I assume they charge a portion of some of that money that you might be awarded, but basically you say, hey, here's my Here's an app. Uh, we probably fill out an application or something, and they they go out and they see if there's there's funds available at all for your type of farm. So there's people out there trying to make that easier. Yeah, and I know I've definitely heard of farm raise and like have considered it for um, for our farm. I don't know if I have like a project lined up yet, but there's also this other. Um, I don't know if y'all are familiar with Kiva and the model Kiva. They um, our, their microfinance, like it is a loan, but it's at a much more favorable rate and it's through people like a crowdsourced loan. But there's this other organization called Steward who, um, like Steward as in you steward the land and they have kind of a Kiva like model, um, that's only for like soil healthy organic type agriculture. You don't need to be certified, but, um, you do have to be to meet these certain requirements and um they so like that's kind of like there's this weird like gap funding that has popped up for small and like specialty farms because like the fsa um usda loans are obviously like really attractive um they're 
uh, their interest rates are really low. Like if you're looking to like buy a farm and, the, and you can get a USDA loan, totally do it. But there are a lot of people who don't qualify for those loans because of certain factors and they don't want to go to a traditional lender because farming is still seen as a super risky business. Cause like, I mean, we're at the mercy of the weather, of the fires, of the everything. Um, and so those like going to a traditional loan um like finance situation is really really difficult like i know people who have gotten uh they've refinanced or like gotten a second mortgage on their house because they can get a loan for the farm house but not the farm um and so that's uh people like steward and kiva um are like trying to be that in between between like you can't get a usda or fsa loan but you don't want to go like traditional loan because the interest rate is going to be way too high or you don't want to take on credit card debt for a specific project. Like if you're trying to put up a hoop house or something. Um, so there's like these in-between options for um, more sustainable, smaller, more diversified farms that are popping up in all kinds of ways. Awesome. Thanks guys. That's really, really interesting stuff. Uh, one more question for me, and then we'll open it up to everybody else. Uh, and uh, sort of an open-ended one, but how do, you, how do you guys see your businesses evolving over the next five years? Uh, Jack, why don't you start this time? I wasn't ready. No, I'm good. Um, okay, yeah. How do we see our um, farm changing? Uh, let's see. Well, let's see, it's Earth Day. So it got me thinking about all the things we need to do to be better stewards of the Earth, um, how we should burn less fossil fuels, use less plastics, all that. Uh, and those are ongoing goals and, and challenges. Um, anyway, um, but sort of that aside, uh, one important uh, step we're, we're working on is with our employees, uh, I think we already have a really positive work culture, but we still need to be a better employer. And uh, while we now offer, we're, we've just figured out how to do IRA retirement option contribution or matching IRA retirement um, contributions. Um, I think we offer competitive farm wages, but farm wages just are not very good in general. So when we say competitive farm wages, that's, um, that's kind of a, a big, uh, caveat there so compared to other industries um and you know as we've been doing this a while some of our our younger employees now um are starting young uh, starting families and how do we convert, create a workplace that does a good job of supporting that um yeah and then uh kind of related to that is our 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 efforts um recently to change our farm name actually from organic redneck to to something to be determined. Um, but that's related to our, our employees too. Just the idea that I think we, we probably could um, do a better job of, of being a place that welcomes people of, of different backgrounds and, and getting a, a better diversity of applicants. Um, and yeah, I'm sure there's more we could do as well, but that's just one of the, one of the steps we're taking. Um, another change we hope to make is more more consistency in the marketplace in, you know, at our farmer's markets, farm stand, just having some of our key crops that we know people really like, uh, having those more, you know, regularly throughout the season. Um, it's challenging with weather and, and farming and, and all the things that um, make consistency challenging in this, this type of work. But um, for example, our frozen blueberries, we've done a pretty good job to get those into a bunch of retail stores and, and have those year round. Um, and the demand keeps growing on those. So it's, it's always, you know, we never know if we're gonna make it to, to the next season's crop as um, people seem to buy more of those, which is great. Um, so that's something just more consistency, trying to, to have the, you know, carrots um, for 10 months out of the year versus only eight months out of the year if we can. Um, Let's see, also we, we have some great relationships with local nonprofits, but we're trying to continue to work with groups like the Eugene Area Gleaners, um, who are awesome. And they've come out almost every week or twice a week sometimes throughout the summer and just like clean out 
a lot of the stuff that's in our fields and um, pick up anything we have in our cooler that that we can't sell or, or have extra of and um, and then you know we also get some produce out to some other um, nonprofits but we're uh, what is it core and lunch people or two but but we'd like to work with some more we'd like to just be more consistent with them and um, the challenge is one, once again is time is you know it's easy to you know, I think a lot of times people who who come to farming for the first time, uh, new employees look at us and they're like, well, why, what's all this waste about, you know, like, can't you get this to a food bank? And it's like, yes, um, but who's going to do it? Who's going to drive it into town right now? Who's going to take that time to do it? Um, so Eugene Area Gleaner has been great since they've come out. Um, if we can get people on one of our regular routes and, and um, other donation places, we can do that. But we do have a new person uh, or, or a new role that's um, kind of more of a sales role, but they're also going to take on um, the donation part of things too, and trying to coordinate that a little better. So that's a that's like a new thing um, that we're just trying to do better at. So these are just goals that we set for for like this year and in coming years. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, I think the Mackenzie, as most people know, uh, pretty much a good portion of it burned down this last year. Um, so that kind of changes what we probably need to do and think about our role in the community. Um, I think things have changed a lot. Um, it's hard to know what, you know, what the Valley will look like. Well, whether there'll be people who are in the Valley for a while who want to like shop at a farm stand. Um, what, what could we provide for people if it's if they don't need fresh produce if they don't need um some of the things that we've been doing so yeah i think that will be an interesting um thing to to navigate and um those are some of the more immediate challenges or, or changes i should say yeah thanks that's awesome thanks jack um, I think in terms of where White Rabbit Gardens is going in the next five years, um, I really hope that we um, in five years are going to be in a position where we can. <laughs> so uh, I'm, I told you that we're a farm team of two, my partner Joey and I, and um, I want to be in a place where we can hire someone and pay them what I want to be able to pay them. Um, so that's my like five-year goal is to be able to pay a living wage to someone <laughs> and we're not there yet definitely which is why we have we do everything ourselves um and we also I think that we still have some infrastructure to build um it's a little tricky because we do have like a pretty long-term lease on this property but um things can change like if in another five years my landlord falls into ill health and needs to sell the property. Um, there are like ways that that might happen. Um, and so we want to find a forever home for the farm because land security is kind of the foundation of any farm business decision, because you don't want to, you don't want to put stuff into the ground that you can't or, or build things that you, um, don't, know if you're going to be able to use in five years or so if they're they're structures that are supposed to last more than five years i want to be able to use them in more than five years um so i think that that land security piece is um we hope to hire someone and hope to have permanent land security and those are our big things um i also would really love to get the can good business side of the business to a place um where we are, I mean, we're pretty dialed now, but I still think that our, our range of products is too big um, because like every time I have to switch recipes, it's a whole production and like different things have different size jars. And there was a jar shortage last year and all of these things. So I want to um, kind of dial in that side of the business and maybe um, reduce our range of products to like six core products that like are pretty, um, uniform so that we can uh, really streamline our production for those and get out of the experimental stage and really like have a line that we are ready to like 
move into a commercial kitchen and brand um, because it would be nice because we do have a ton of, well, not a ton, but like some backstock of those things um, that we keep over the winter so that we have, I mean, we eat it, but also, so we have stuff at the very early markets. Um, but because of the way that the farm direct producer process exemption works and the fact that I process on farm means that I can only sell those things direct to consumer from my hand to theirs. I can't consign them. I can't sell them to a store. I can't do any of those things because of the regulation. So I want to get to a place where um, I can access a commercial kitchen in a way that's uh, in a, at a price that's commercially viable for me um, and my business and like close enough to my house that I can do it while I'm still farming. So that's a whole slew of um, ifs. But um, yeah, I would want to have land security, hire someone at a wage that I consider a living wage um, for our community and uh, dial in our canned good business to reduce waste and maintain that um, year-round income. That's great. You guys, I like feeling, my, feeling myself uh, get excited for you all hearing about those plans. It's uh, really inspiring. I, I mean that. Um, awesome. Thank you. Uh, Kimmy and Ivy, do, do either of you have questions for Jack or Alice? Um, yeah, you feel free to just jump in. You're on mute, Ivy. Yeah. Thank you. Gardening. For... It's so exciting. You're yeah, I'm out celebrating Earth Day today. I'm just doing some gardening. Um, thank you very much for that. I'm interested in farming, but I'm really have not gotten super involved or anything. Um, but I'm kind of curious as to how you manage like a lot of the uncertainty as to, you were just talking about financial stability and land security and that sort of thing, how you manage um, predicting into the future while still dealing with the uncertainty um, and also just handling a lot of the bureaucratic things like, I didn't know that you couldn't have people on your farm without having a permit. And so just kind of navigating all of those things. You wanna take that, Alice? Sure. Um, yeah, so I, I mean, the reason that I have an off farm job is because so when I made the transition from working for other people full time to starting our own place, we lost that income security. And that was a scary ish time uh, for us because we went from like, being uh, 40 hour a week out well 40 plus hour a week employees on someone else's place um with a fixed wage where we knew what was coming in um and then when we went out on our own um I didn't have well I still was running the other farmers market um that was like a part-time like weekend job um so yeah that one of the reasons that we have started so small is because we are on ground that's never been farmed before and we kind of lucked into. So we needed to do a lot of infrastructure building and we knew it was gonna be expensive. So we decided to do very incremental change. And I think like patience and being okay with building a little bit every year and, and moving slowly through the process, I think is something that's absolutely necessary. Um, and understanding that like, you're probably not going to be profitable right away. And so I have had, like my partner does the farm full time and I have an off farm job to supplement our income so that we can have the security to plan for the future while also um, maintaining our presence at our sales outlets and building our brand and doing all those other sorts of things. Um, and so I think like being realistic about having a part-time job when you first start out um, is, it's been super helpful to me to have that security. Um, and in terms of regulation, I would say there's a lot of great resources, um, especially if you're trying, if you're looking to sell at farmer's markets, there's actually some great resources on the Oregon Farmer's Market Association website. Uh, they're designed for market managers to tell like which products need which licenses or whatever, but they can be super helpful for a farmer who's like, I think I wanna do this thing. 
do I need um, a license or like, do I need insurance for that? Um, and then also like the, the ODA food safety website has a ton of um, really awesome fact sheets about in, the, they have a whole page called what can I do without a license? <laughs> and so that was really helpful for me. Um, ooh, another thing that I do a lot to like check in on um, regulations is <laughs> I call and have um, an anonymous, I don't give my name and I have a hypothetical conversation with the ODA food safety people. Um, and I'm like, hey, I know this person who wants to do this thing and is maybe already doing it. What should they know? And they don't ask a lot of questions and they're super helpful. And like I had a, I had a, there's also like the home baking bill. And I was like, I have so much zucchini last year. So I was like, maybe I'll just make some like mini zucchini loaves and bring them to market. And it was super cute. Uh, it turned out to be way too much work and I ended up stopping doing it um, halfway through the season. But when I was um, going down that road, I just like, I called food safety and I was like, hey, what do you think about zucchini bread at farmer's markets? Is there, is this under the baking bill? And they were like, actually, I'm not sure, let me call you back. And then they called me back two hours later and gave me all the information that I needed um, and didn't ask me for my name or where I was selling them or anything like that. So um, I would definitely check out the ODA food safety things as well as, um, and give them a call if you would like to. They're not as responsive now that they're not in the office because of COVID. Um, so give yourself some time. Um, and what else would I say about that? I don't know. Did that answer your question, Ivy? I hope so. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Cool. I thought of another goal for my farm uh, while we were talking, though. I hope to have a prop house that's not my living room. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I, I aspire to have a prop house that is my living room, <laughs> but maybe not, maybe not for production, but, but a greenhouse in your living room is pretty cool. <laughs> Yeah, I think that, oh, I guess another thing um, that I, that we have, stri we strive to do is we have reduced our living costs dramatically. And I mean, it's only because we don't have, we don't have a lot of debt and we don't have children that we're able to do this, honestly, but like we live in a one room cabin built by amateurs on our farm. And like, it's definitely not like, an ideal home, um, but it works. And I think like reducing your living expenses can get you really far. Um, before this, I lived in, I lived in a 160 square foot converted garden shed for two years with my partner and our, and our great Pyrenees were both over six feet tall. It was not a lot of space for us. Um, but yeah, I think I wouldn't advocate doing anything that makes you feel uncomfortable or puts you in a dangerous situation. Like definitely you need to be safe, secure, and well, um, but anything you can do to lessen your living expenses will also help your farm dream. Um, yeah. Awesome. Well, we're a little over time and we could certainly answer one more question if you all are willing to stay, but are there any last questions here? before we wrap up. Kimmy, I know you're driving. Ivy, are you good on questions? I would have another one if people are okay with timing. You all yeah. okay to stay? Okay, yeah, okay. go for it. Um, I'm curious to hear a little bit more about how you kind of um, develop relationships with consumers and both respond to what they want and like get people more excited about supporting small scale farms and that sort of thing. Um, I came from a community that there weren't really a lot of uh, farmers markets and um, I'm in Portland now and it's, it's, I love the fact that it's a, such a part of the culture, um, but I can understand how it would be hard to kind of find value in that if, if you didn't know about it. So how you kind of navigate that. And that's could, for anyone. Yeah. yeah, I could, I could start with that one. I, I um, you're welcome to add onto this too, Alice. Uh, mm, so yeah, I, the experience I have is a little different from, um, from coming from a farm that had some presence already uh, at, you know, the farm stand and, and my folks had sold some blueberries at some farmer's markets. And so 
the farmer's market wasn't um, totally unknown. Um, obviously, uh, talking to people um, and once you're at a farmer's market and you're bringing something interesting or different, um, it starts conversations and you can pretty quickly uh, get to know people and they'll start advocating for you pretty quickly. And before you know it, you've got, you know, 10 super fans. And once you've got 10 super fans, you can maybe sell 10 CSA shares and maybe they'll tell their friends and maybe you can get a little bit of capital upfront with those CSA shares that you sell. So I think CSA is a great way for people to get started for that reason. Um, but you need to be confident enough to actually grow that that produce for those CSA shares too. So knowing where your skill level is and if you're still not confident that you can grow enough produce for those, then maybe just try to sell what you can grow at the farmer's market if you have some. Um, and people who have gone on from our farm, a lot of people have gone on into uh, different communities and started their farms. And some in some pretty strange, uh, or not strange, but just, you know, corners of the state that aren't big farmers market areas um, far over on the east side. And, and I think once again, it's, it's, you know, people might think a small organic farm, um, you know, run by a young person is, is kind of a weird thing, but, but people like people. And so if you can make that human connection with some of your friends and neighbors and, and people, you know, and your dentist and your, uh, barber or whoever else that you meet, just tell them you're growing food and bring them some, you know, delicious somethings um, pretty quickly. The word spreads and you're, you're off and running. Yeah, I would echo what Jack said, especially about like having one kind of like unexpected conversation piece um, at your farm stand. I know like what we, what we did our first year was we grew as many purple vegetables as possible. Like we grew, we grew purple cauliflower, purple kohlrabi, purple. We only grew purple radishes. We like grew as much purple stuff as we could because we knew people would, um, it would catch somebody's eye and like they would want to come over and talk to us and we could tell them why it's so purple. Um, and the other thing, uh, the other thing that's been super successful for us, um, was <laughs> it sounds weird but I picked a vegetable to evangelize about my vegetable is kohlrabi <laughs> and I um I kind of like use that as a well when before COVID when we could have samples um at the farmer's market in an easier way that don't need like single serving containers we would give out kohlrabi samples and I would say I would like start conversations with people like have you ever heard of kohlrabi and they would be like, what is a kohlrabi? And I'd be like, this thing, it looks like an alien vegetable and tastes like broccoli water chestnuts, you'll love it. And so I think that like having one, um, I also I also used to be a, a political canvasser. So having a hook is very important. <laughs> um, but if you have one kind of like, uh, like, fun lead-in vegetable, it can help start a conversation that will get people more interested in your farm. Um, and yeah, and I would say word of mouth is so important. And um, really like, especially like during the pandemic last year, we started taking um, a bunch of just like individual orders. And I had like a really good friend who would vend at farmer's markets for us sometimes on the weekends. And she would go back to her weekday job and be like, oh my God, there's these people, they have these vegetables. And so then she was like getting us orders from her whole office and we would drop off just like bags of produce in the, we would like do produce handoffs in the, in the parking lot of her office building. Um, and so, yeah, that person to person thing and telling your story is important. And then also having something, um, just like a fallback conversation starter at the farmer's market is really, really important. And, and as a caveat, I grew up in Kentucky and there's not a huge amount of farmer's market culture in Kentucky. I mean, there are pockets, but it's, I didn't grow up going to farmer's market. So it was really intimidating when I started. Um, but yeah, as long as you have like one thing to talk about, you can bring someone in and they'll, they'll ask questions because like produce is fun. <laughs> awesome. Such good answers, such good questions. Well, thank you all so much for being here. 
we really appreciate you. Yeah, thank you so much, Jack and Alice. That was incredible information and yeah, a lot of good stuff there. Micah, you have closing thoughts? No, I just really appreciate Jack and Alice uh, taking time to chat with us. I know you both are busy and it's nice out today. So yeah, good, yeah. good to see you both. And thank you, it means a lot. Yeah, thank you. Enjoy the rest of the day. Yeah, yeah. see you guys. Happy Earth Day. Yeah. Thank you all. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.